Right. So we are recording now. And uh, let's talk about uh, where we stopped yesterday, right? So we looked at this unbounded example and we solved it using the simplex method. We didn't do all the steps, but uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, I think there are only two dictionaries, so it's easy. And we arrived at this second dictionary and we looked at this column here, the X1 column. And we concluded that this LP is unbounded, right? Because all the coefficients um, in the second and the third uh, equations here, they are uh, non-negative, right? Which means you can keep increasing X1 and you will always have a feasible solution because X2 and X5 will just change according to the change in X1. Right? And they will always be non-negative because you already have a feasible solution. So my question to you was, can you come up with a vector D? It's a direction vector in some sense. And uh, that vector should immediately prove that the given LP is unbounded using this dictionary. So does anybody have an answer? So we could try one two zero zero one. One two zero zero one. Great. So one two zero zero. All right. So what was your rationale behind coming up with this? Uh, f plus lambda. F f was the original basis. Uh, I mean, I I, I mean, I, I can't remember if I noted on the uh, like the equations correctly, but if if I got this equation correctly, f was the original basis of 0, 0, 1, 3, and f plus lambda v was also feasible. And the uh, objective function at f plus lambda v was equal to lambda, which is why high. Right, right. So basically, you are saying that if you, you are adding this direction vector to your basic feasible solution, uh, to your feasible solution, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Right, right, exactly. Right, so notice that we already have a feasible solution here, right? which is the following, um, it's 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, right? And if you, so X bar is a feasible solution, which is the basic feasible solution corresponding to this dictionary. And you can add this direction vector to it and you will get another feasible solution. And in fact, you can add it again and you will get yet another feasible solution and your objective value will keep increasing because you are constantly adding uh, one in the X1 component, right? And the objective function is going to increase because it's one plus X1 minus X3 minus X4 and X3 and X4 don't even matter because they are zero in both of these vectors. Right, so you're just increasing the objective uh, function value as you keep adding the direction vector to your feasible solution. And that means you're constantly going to get better and better optimal values, well, which means that the LP is unbounded, there is no optimal value. Okay, so this is exactly the point. So notice that I'm just going to make a box here. X bar plus B is a feasible solution. In fact, you can take X bar plus 2D. In fact, you can take X bar plus TD, where T is any uh, non-negative real number. And the other important point to note is that um, as T goes to infinity, the objective value corresponding to the uh, solution also tends to infinity. Note that as T tends to infinity, C transpose X bar plus TD also tends to infinity. So this is the main point. So now I want to write down a generalization that is applicable to all LPs in SEF. 
So what are the properties that this vector D must satisfy so that you can make the same argument for any LP in standard equality form? So let's say we have some LP in SEF. Maximize C transpose X plus some scalar subject to AX equals B and X at least zero. Okay. And let's say you already have a feasible solution because if you want to prove, if you want to convince someone that your LP is unbounded, you first must convince them that it is feasible, right? So let's say X bar is a feasible solution. So, what properties should uh, the vector D satisfy in order to conclude that the given LP is unbounded? Right, so let's call this given LP. Anyone? Sir, I constructed this by finding uh, V such that AD is great, equal to zero and C transpose D is greater than zero. Okay, great. So we've got uh, one, uh, two, and three. I mean, assuming that D was a color vector. Yeah. All right, so the right dimensions, that's fine. AD is zero and C transpose D is greater than zero. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. That was uh, what I was looking at when I was trying to find these. Right. There is one more thing you're actually using. There exists a feasible solution. Uh, that's already fine. There is another property of D that you need. So AD equal D to greater than, D greater than equal to zero, right? In fact, it will have to be, it can't be equal to zero because C transpose D is greater than zero. Uh, I want to make one small uh, remark here. Uh, I just said that D cannot be equal to zero. Does that imply that D is greater than zero? Uh, no, sir, like it, no. some elements could be zero. Right, some elements could be zero. So notice that we are dealing with vectors here, right? So just because something is greater than or equal to zero does not mean that it has to be either exactly the zero vector or that it has to be greater than the zero vector because greater than zero vector means that every component is greater. So some components could be zero and some, the rest would be greater than zero. Okay. So that's anyways, just a side comment. Um, all right, so it turns out these are exactly the three properties we need. In other words, whenever you have such a vector, you can immediately conclude that your LP is unbounded, uh, your LP in standard equality form, right? So that is um, proposition 2.2 in the text we are following. Um, in fact, all right, so let me write it this way. So LP is already written here. We have an LP in SEF. If there exists an X bar a feasible solution and a vector, let me call it a direction vector, D uh, that satisfies these three properties, then the linear program is unbounded. I hope everybody sees how to prove this, right? In fact, we have written the main points over here already. You will always have a feasible solution and as T goes to infinity, the objective value will keep increasing. You need to prove these things by just doing simple linear algebra. 
Okay. So so do it yourself. Prove the forward direction because it turns out that this is actually an if and only if statement. So and let me remove this. Okay, so whenever the LP is unbounded, there must exist a feasible solution and a direction vector that satisfies all of these three properties. We are talking about LPs in standard equality form. Okay, if your LP is not in this form, you can write an equivalent LP in this form, and then the same proposition applies. Alternatively, you can also get a certificate of unboundedness for the original LP. But uh, I'm not going to bother writing down for all possible LPs, right? You're going to focus on standard equality form LPs. So, what about the other direction? So, one direction is clearly easy. If you have a feasible solution and a direction vector, then your LP is definitely unbounded. Right? That you can prove yourself. Um, what about the other direction? So, whenever the LP is unbounded, how can we claim this? Well, this follows from the correctness of the simplex method. The fact that the simplex method uh, with Bland's rule, we haven't proved this, always terminates in a finite number of steps, right? So once you prove that, you know that if you have an unbounded LP, it will also give you a direction vector. You just need to look at the last dictionary and that is going to be your direction vector. And you can also get the feasible solution from. Okay, so the other direction, which is more difficult, follows from the fact that simplex with Bland's rule terminates in a finite number of steps. Sir, can we have a different kind of argument for the same thing? Because suppose we say that a, a particular LP is uh, unbounded. So okay. this means there, there are multiple X values such that AX is equal to B, but they are satisfying that uh, C transpose X, C transpose X plus S, giving the same value for that. So, which, so if AX equal to B has multiple values, which means A has a definite null space and which means AD should be zero. Some vector D should exist, otherwise it cannot work. Right. So right. you would have to formalize that. Um, so it's clear that you will get a set of feasible solutions such that the objective value will keep increasing, right? Ah, yes, sir. We can do that because, and we are also having that AX equal to B for multiple X values because for each X value, we are saying that the value is increasing. Yeah, what so I don't see I don't entirely. See no, so I see that there will be a set of feasible solutions, but why should they be in a specific direction? Okay. Uh, right? yeah. I mean, they could be they could be spread out arbitrarily in the polyhedron. Okay, I get so, that. Uh, I think we might be able to do it using duality, but I'll have to think more about it. So probably okay. using duality, we might be able to get a proof of this. Um, we might see that in the next module, but I'm not entirely sure right now. Okay. okay. Yeah. But yeah, there should be proofs that do not depend on the correctness of simplex. In fact, there are definitely are. I just don't know one off the top of my head. Yeah. So you don't need simplex correctness to prove this, but it does follow from that too. Uh, but we haven't actually proved that simplex with Bland's rule terminates, uh, partly because it's going to take a lot of time and it might be slightly orthogonal to the main objectives of this course. All right. Okay. Any other uh, questions, concerns, remarks? So I want to make one small comment about um, NP, co-NP, and P over here. So you can ask the decision problem, right? 
given a linear program in standard equality form, decide whether it is unbounded or not. Um, so in particular, if you want to, for a yes instance, this is an NP certificate. Right? So this is an NP certificate for uh, yes instances. For the decision problem, decide whether given LP in standard equality form is unbounded. Right, so this decision problem in particular uh, belongs to NP because this certificate always exists by the correctness of the simplex method, right? And if you have such a certificate, if you if I give you an X bar and a D, you can just plug it in and check that all the conditions hold. That X bar is a feasible solution and the direction vector satisfies conditions one, two, and three, right? So all this can be checked in polynomial time is fairly straightforward. You're just checking a bunch of inequalities and equations, right? Uh, what is interesting is that the simplex method is not known to terminate in polynomially number of uh, polynomial number of steps. Right? The simplex method terminates in a finite number of steps, but it's not known to be polynomial time. Right? So at this prop at this point, you cannot say that the problem is uh, polynomial time solvable, but it is in NP. There are actually polynomial time algorithms for simplex, um, which we are not going to be studying in this course. Uh, I might tell you a little bit about that tomorrow, uh, because tomorrow I plan to tell you a little bit about the history of linear programming, including simplex and uh, the polynomial time algorithms. Uh, because tomorrow's lecture is at eight o'clock in the morning, and I don't want to start a new module on Friday at eight o'clock. Right? So we are just going to talk about history. It's going to be a chill lecture. Um, about these kinds of um, nuggets, historical nuggets. Okay. So, anyway, so that's all about certificate of unboundedness. So, this kind of X bar, comma D is called a certificate of unboundedness. So that's good. So we have one certificate when the LP is unbound. What about the other two possibilities? Uh, when the LP is uh, infeasible or when it has an optimal solution. So I want to talk about infeasibility today. Um, let's start a new page. And So let's start with one example. Uh, we will do the two phase uh, method uh, really quick without doing all the steps. So consider the following LP. Maximize three one minus two one X subject to uh, the following constraints. All right. So if you look at this LP, you don't immediately see a feasible basis, right? So we are going to apply the two phase method. We are going to write down the auxiliary LP. Right? So let's first modify the constraints. So we want to add one auxiliary variable per constraint. Okay. 
And what we want to do is we want to minimize x5 plus x6, which is the same as maximizing minus x5 minus x6. Okay, and now let's begin uh, phase one. Let's solve this LP. So the first dictionary is going to be X5 and X6 and uh, Z, right? So the basis is five and six. So x5 and x, x6, we can immediately write um, using the other four variables, right? By rearranging these equations. So we get 9 plus 3x1 minus 8x2 plus 6x3 minus 2x4. And the second one is 5 plus 2x1 minus 2x2 plus 4x3 minus x let me know if I make any mistakes. Okay. And well, Z is minus X5 minus X6. So we can just add up these two, uh, these two and negate the sum, right? Which is what we did yesterday. Minus 14, uh, 5 will be minus 5. Minus 10 will become plus 10. Plus 10 will become minus 10. And minus 3 becomes plus 3. Okay, so you've got our first dictionary and um, you can do it yourself. And you will see that the last dictionary is as follows if you follow Bland's rule. So the final dictionary is for the basis 4, 6 and it reads as follows. Let me actually put fractions. So it's minus half, minus half x1, minus 2x2, minus x3, minus 3 over 2x5. And you will have something for x4 and something for x6. I'm not going to write it down. Okay. But let's just look at our objective function. Right? At this point, you can conclude that you have found an optimal solution for the auxiliary LP because all the coefficients in the Z row are uh, non-positive. So at this point, we know that the auxiliary LP um, has optimal value. minus half, which in particular is not equal to zero. So what can we conclude about the original LP? It has a feasible solution. Sorry, it has a feasible solution or it does not have a feasible solution. Let's look at the two LPs. Uh, it, it does not have a feasible solution. It does not have a feasible solution, right? Because if it had a feasible solution, then you would take that feasible solution and uh, put x5 and x6 equal to zero, and you will get objective value uh, zero for your feasible solution for the auxiliary LP, right? But the optimal value is minus half, so you can't have a solution with value zero. Right? So this implies that the original LP is infeasible based on our discussion yesterday and the argument that I just said. Right? All right. So this is one way you could convince someone, right? So if, uh, if I give you this LP and uh, let's say you want to convince your friend that this is an infeasible LP, you would start by this auxiliary LP. You would put all the dictionaries. Notice that you don't have just two dictionaries in this example, because if you follow Bland's rule, 
the next variable entering would be x2. So it will take you a while before you get to four comma six basis, right? So you are going to have three, four dictionaries, maybe, I don't know. And then you will tell your friend that look at this row and conclude that the original LP is infeasible, right? But what if we want to do it in a more direct fashion, like we did for unboundedness by just showing one vector, right? So can we get a certificate of infeasibility from this dictionary? So the answer is yes, we can get it from this dictionary, but I just want to first show you the certificate, uh, discuss the certificate, and then talk about how to get it from this dictionary, okay? So the question is, Can we get a succinct certificate uh, to show that the original LP is indeed infeasible? Okay. So uh, turns out the answer is yes, as you probably expect. So let's look at the original LP. I'm going to write down the constraints uh, in uh, proper equations. Minus 3x1 plus 8x2 minus 6x3 plus 2x4 equal to 9. And minus two, two, minus four, and one. Minus two, two, minus four, and one. And if I remember correctly, the right hand side is five. So these are our constraints. And we also have uh, x at least zero, of course. Right? We are talking about feasibility. So we don't care about the objective uh, function, right? So let's suppose, let me convince you without going through simplex that this LP is indeed infeasible, right? So let X bar be a feasible solution for the sake of contradiction. So that means that X bar has to satisfy all of these uh, constraints. Okay. So, well, if it satisfies these constraints, it also satisfies any multiple of these constraints. So let me multiply the first constraint by half because I, I like half. Okay. So in particular, it satisfies minus three over two X one plus four X two, sorry, X bar minus three x three and plus x four equal to nine over two. Right? Does everybody agree? It must satisfy this constraint. I've just multiplied the first constraint by half. And let me multiply the second constraint by minus one. Okay? So I can multiply by minus one, right? It's an equation. I can multiply both sides by minus one. So I get two X one bar, uh, sorry, not, yeah, minus one would be two, minus two X two bar, uh, plus four X three bar, and minus X four bar equal to uh, minus five. Does everybody agree? But if it satisfies both of these equations, it also has to satisfy any linear combination of these equations, right? In particular, I can just add them. So let's add them. Right, so two minus three over two is half X one bar. Four minus two is two X two bar. Minus three plus four is x three bar, and x four by minus x four bar is zero, and minus five plus nine over two is minus ten over two plus nine over two is minus half.
does anybody see a problem so is that some positive numbers are adding to a negative number right some not negative numbers in particular are adding to a negative number right this is a contradiction because this side always has to be at least zero and this side is less than zero right because we know that this is a feasible solution so definitely the left hand side has to be at least zero and the right hand side is negative so we have a contradiction right so we conclude that the original lp is indeed infeasible Okay, so let's see if we can generalize what we just did. So what we did is we actually took a linear combination of the given constraints, uh, which basically means that we could have just multiplied our matrix A by a vector Y transpose, which would correspond to this particular linear combination, right? And in this case, our vector Y transpose Would be what would be our vector? Can someone tell me? I don't remember what I did anymore. We multiplied the first constraint by half, right? And the second one by minus one, right? So our vector should be half and minus one. And what we did is we considered y transpose a x equal to y transpose b, right? That is exactly what we are doing here. However, what is y transpose a? Let's just do it half minus one multiplied by the matrix we have, which is. Um, uh, 9, 3, minus 8, 6, sorry, minus 3, 8, minus 6, 2. And 5, 2, minus 2, uh, sorry, no, minus 2, 2, minus 4, 1. Right? And if you do that, you will get exactly what we have here. Half, 2, 1, and 0. And y transpose b, well, we can just compute it. It's a small thing. Um, what is our b vector? It's 9, 5. That is exactly 9 over 2 minus 5, which would be minus half, which is what we got over here. Right? And the point is that y transpose a is non-negative so y transpose a x this is non-negative this is non-negative uh, however this should be equal to y transpose b which is less than uh, zero in this example and that's our contradiction right so we did the same thing in two different ways first by just adding the equations and then just by doing this uh, multiplication by y transpose right they are equivalent but I just want everybody to be very comfortable with this because we are going to use these kinds of arguments a lot in the next module on duality, right? So when you see Y transpose AX, you want to read it not as symbols, but as a linear combination of your given constraints, right? That's the intuition behind it. All right, so the point is, if you have a vector Y transpose with these properties, then you definitely know that your LP in standard equality form is actually infeasible. So I think this is proposition 2.1. Um, 
actually check with me because I forgot to make a note of it in my notes. Um, yeah. All right. So in fact, um, notice that we don't even need to talk about an LP. We just need to talk about AX equal to B and X at least zero, right? Because we are discussing feasibility. So given AX equals B, X at least zero, if there exists a vector Y uh, such that Y transpose A is at least zero, and y transpose b is strictly less than zero, then there does not exist any feasible solution to this system. Well, let me just say, then the given system is infeasible. Right? I hope everybody can write down a formal proof. I mean, we kind of already wrote it down, but you should do it on your, on your own as well to put in all the steps. So turns out, as you may expect, this is also an if and only if statement. The converse direction is actually a deep result called Farkash Lemma. So let me just change it here and make it an if and only if statement. So the forward direction is straightforward. Uh, write down a rigorous proof yourself. And the converse direction is actually a deep result called Farkash Lem. Um, again, there are at least two ways to prove it. One is we can actually get the certificate from simplex and we can prove it in that way by correctness of simplex method. We will also be doing a proof of this in the duality uh, module. Or by correctness of simplex. Of course, what we haven't discussed is how to get this vector using our dictionaries, right? Because that is necessary for this argument. Right? So the fact that we can extract such a vector Y transpose from one of our dictionaries by doing the simplex method, that is something we haven't discussed yet. So I just want to show you quickly, um, it's actually not something I want to go into detail right now, but I just want to tell you how to go about it. So notice that we are trying to find a certificate of infeasibility for the original LP. And the original LP is infeasible because the auxiliary LP has an optimal value less than zero, right? It was minus half in our example. So that means that the infeasibility of the original LP has something to do with the optimality of the auxiliary LP. So that's exactly what happens. The, the problem is we haven't discussed certificate of optimality because I'm planning to discuss that in duality. So I'll just make a note here, certificate of infeasibility of the original LP is basically the same as the certificate of optimality of the auxiliary LP which kind of intuitively makes sense, right? Because we didn't actually do the simplex method on the original LP. We just did phase one, which was doing simplex on the auxiliary LP. So we want to extract our certificate from those dictionaries for the auxiliary LP, right? The problem, however, however is we haven't discussed certificate of optimality yet. So this we are going to discuss in the next module because it's very closely tied with duality. So I don't want to repeat things too many times. So we will discuss this in module uh, four, right? Uh, for now, I will just tell you what the formula is so that we can actually get the uh, vector. 
and check that it is actually the vector I used, which was a uh, half minus one. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, dictionary here. What is the basis? It's four six. So I'm going to look at this LP here, which is our auxiliary LP, and compute the vector in the following way. Y transpose is CB transpose times AB inverse, where B is our basis four six from the last dictionary, right? So what is CB transpose? And here, here we are referring to uh, C and a in the auxiliary LP, right? So we are taking we are taking the fourth entry and the sixth entry, and here we are taking the fourth column and the sixth column. Okay, so I just I'm just showing you how it's computed. Uh, the correctness of it will become clearer when we discuss duality. So it's a uh, zero minus one times this matrix two one zero one columns inverse and you can compute this yourself and check that you actually get exactly the certificate i used which was half and minus one multiply the first constraint by half and the second constraint by minus one okay um, let me just see. Yeah, that's exactly what we have here. Okay, so that's how we compute it from the dictionary uh, for the auxiliary LP, and it works as a certificate of infeasibility for the original LP. Why exactly is this the formula? Will become clear in module four. All right. Um, are there any questions or concerns regarding how we extracted it from the dictionary? Not why, but how. Okay, so if not, I just want to say that tomorrow we are going to discuss uh, history of LP. I might say a few things here and there about NP, PNP, and CoNP, um, but we'll focus mostly on. Uh, cool aspects about um, the history and how it was closely tied with the world wars, etc. All right, and we will start module uh, four on Monday. Tomorrow's lecture is at 8 a.m. because of the some exchange of slots. I think slot F and G have been interchanged. All right, so that's all for today. I'm still here for another 10 minutes if there are any questions or concerns.